Nobody imagined we'd actually shift the entire action. And yet it came out of the creativity of the moment because it was the truth. And we were able to sustain it by having a really rigid structure and strong facilitation. But these days, people don't want that. So they think that's somehow against our principles. And then what we get is a mess that doesn't live our principles at all, and that movements die. So again, we stop a direct invasion, definitely, and we certainly expose the truth of what actually happened so that these days, many more people than otherwise would know about what really happened back then. Although still far too few people understand the October surprise and the whole arc of the domination and control of Central America. And why we have so many illegal immigrants and why immigration is such an issue in this country is because all the people who were being attacked there came here and now they're a problem because they're awake. They're not willing to be oppressed. And they know the alternative. So that's what I see activism is. It involves organizing by small groups, that small groups should be self-sufficient and autonomous, that the way you organize into larger groups is through consensus decision-making spokes councils. The, this book right here, these are the books. This is the book I wrote in 87. When I went to the coordinating council of the Pledge of Resistance, right? And Lisa's there and all these people are sitting around the table. And I say, we're having people join this pledge. We're having people sign the pledge 100 people at a time every week. You know, every week we're getting 100 people signing up. We're forming affinity groups as fast as we can, but they're having no way to plug into the process because they don't know consensus. It's a new thing to all these people. They know voting, but we're not using voting. How do they plug in? Hey. So I said, well, we should be teaching them consensus. And everybody's looked at me and went, great idea, CT. And you know about volunteer groups, you know what that meant. You do it. <laughs> so me, being totally the optimist and totally the naive activist, and I was pretty young at the time, I said, oh, great, I'll do it. Because I assumed there would be a book that would say, oh, this is how you do consensus. Start here, go through these steps, and there. You know, there is a book for Robert's Rule, called Robert's Rules for how you do voting which is way more rules than anybody ever wants to know about how to do voting, right? So I figured there'd be a book like that. Well, much to my disappointment and bummer, there wasn't one. I couldn't find one. So I was going to do a study group, right? I was going to get the book and study it. So I had to write, and again, I started out thinking it would take me a couple months, maybe, you know, like two months, you know, and I'd be done. And all I was doing was writing down what I learned, I thought. Well, it took a year and a half. It took me all the way to 87. By 87, the pledge had gone by. It was still around a little bit, and it's still around today, a little bit, but mostly it had passed. So I wrote the book for that movement, but it wasn't around. And it turned out that I had done something new. When I gave it out to people, I didn't put my name on the cover, I didn't put Amy's name on the cover. I said I didn't do anything new, it's just what I learned. And people read it and said, no, no, CT, you, you changed it. You added some things. I did, it turned out. I added two things, or a couple of small things. Uh, I'm not doing a workshop, that's the next book. Then, uh, two year, three years ago, because I discovered I have PTSD, because I mentioned all the beatings, right? I've been arrested over 50 times. Some of you heard that. But I don't think that you put in context, I don't get arrested at every protest I go to. So, you know, I've been to 500 protests. Well, I stopped counting, but, you know, that's ridiculous too. That's, and, and I've been to like thousands and thousands and thousands of meetings. I'm kind of crazy. That's what I've done with my life, okay? But because, I mean, some of those arrests, I mean, all the arrests are kind of brutal. You know, they don't, they're not known for their gentleness. And depending upon the city, and depending upon the cause, they're more or less brutal. And in San Francisco, where they knew me and they hated Putin Up Bombs, there was thousands of arrests of Putin Up Bombs actors. And you know, every time they saw me, because I had an injunction against me personally, Keith and I had a personal injunction against us. So if I just showed up on the street, they would arrest me. And I got arrested too much there. I have my own videotape. I'll bet you put it on YouTube when I'm, when I'm ready. But I have my own videotape of the San Francisco police torturing me right on the street. And you, it's only 20 minutes long, 20 seconds long, but when you're being tortured, that's a long time. But you actually see the police officer. I'm on the ground, I'm going limp, I'm handcuffed, or they use those plastic cuffs on my back, I'm handcuffed, I'm laying on the ground, and a cop walks over, he puts his knee on the middle of my back and says, get up. Which he knew I wasn't gonna, and he knew I couldn't. And then he proceeds to push in this little soft spot right here behind your ear, really, really, like my head's on the ground, he's leaning into it, and that hurt a lot. It hurt so much that I threw two cops, two cops were bigger than me, off of me, Ooh. by reacting, which was a change in, my, in the videotape, it's really ugly, but that's a change because prior to that, I wouldn't show pain. I was such a discipline, and I was known in New England for being able to be beaten by the police and have it look like I wasn't even there. I mean, I just was not there. I left my body, that's how I did it. It was a meditative. 
practice. Well, I would leave my body and they would beat on me and I just wouldn't respond. But I began realizing I was doing violence to myself by not responding to the violence they were doing to me to show them that it hurt as a way of communicating. So I started screaming uh, and twisting. And they eventually dislocated my shoulder and left me in the There's a videotape that shows all this. The point of it is I have PTSD. I didn't know it. And three years ago, I thought I was dying. I was, my brain was beginning to go. And so my, my friend, Jerry, who's a kind of wealthy person out on Long Island, he let me live in his house for a year to write this book. And then he wouldn't let, he said, he was the only person I told in my life that I was, thought I was dying. I didn't die. <laughs> yeah, and I'm doing better. I'm, I've, I've learned how to control it. Medical marijuana, yes. Um, I wrote this book so I wouldn't die without it written. This is how to use this model for affinity group structure and for cities of up to 100,000 people. The idea being, I believe with this model, this book, you could run a city or group of 100,000 people without any politician, without any professional leaders, without anybody doing it full time who's in charge. That a group of people using consensus, running their group up to 100,000. And the reason why I go up to 100,000 is that it, uh, I do maintain still a face-to-face -face meeting. And of course, they're all small meetings with, with uh, spokes councils. But if you're involved at a level of larger than 100,000 in a single organization, you're going to so many meetings, it's becoming a full-time job for you. You can't have a regular life. But everybody else, up to, I mean, so a group up to 100,000 or below, you can run it, I believe, the governance of it, whether it's a city or an organization, by consensus, without leaders, without professional leaders. So you still have, you still have the government workers, the people who implement the decisions. You still have the coordinating council implementing the decisions. They do a lot more work. They even make it paid. But the people making the decisions would be the people. It would actually be a government of the people, by the people, and, oh, wow, maybe even for the people. So I believe that's actually what this book is. I believe it's that revolutionary. I'm actually encouraged by some people recently that have come into my life um, who are saying that it's not just a better meeting process, it's a better way of relating human to human. And it's called value-based consensus. So um, if, unless there's any questions about what I've already said so far, I'm happy to take questions right now, or I can spend whatever amount of time I have to go to work over here at 3 o'clock because I managed to get totally broke. Trying to teach do you consensus. Have over there, so I do on the some? table. Okay. Yeah, I'm supposed to be selling them, but they're sitting over there, so I'm hoping people are being. I should have a sign out or something. Yeah, that's going to work. In in the what's it called? Consensus, consensus for cities. cities. Yeah. Conveniently enough. Um, how do you think? You know, like right now, like one. I recently heard someone say that like civilization is a collaboration problem. Or it's always, yeah. and we keep creating better and better ways to collaborate. Yeah. So, given that we have all of this like different social media technology now, how can that help? Not replace, but right. how can that help? Which is the end? Uh, social, te social, te social technology, so that we can be organizing in these new, more peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, local right. ways. Well, I have a funny answer to that. We actually call what we teach social technology, including the census model itself. But I think you're talking about the electronic social technology, okay? I have a big concern about them, and this is, seems to be pretty obvious, and yet we seem to be in denial about this like everything else. Really, denial is a real problem in this country. We're really good at it. We all love to swim in Egypt. We're all in denial. Um, um, the issue is, is that we know, I mean, people say glibly that, um, that communication between humans 80% of what actually is communicated is nonverbal. You say it all the time. People say that no one ever objects. No one, I haven't seen any scientific evidence that says that's not true. I mean, we seem to accept that as sort of conventional wisdom. And yet in the electronic social media, virtually 100% of that nonverbal communication is cut out. So what you're left with is a 20% effective communication style that you're then relying on to do all of your communicating. Major problem. So what we refer to as social technologies is not so much Facebook and, and tweeting and stuff like that. They're fine for communicating, just communicating. That's all they do. They just communicate data, and often really badly. The spin, the nuances get misinterpreted. And you know, I don't know. In the early days of email, people had a really hard learning curve about what a email actually was. Because all kinds of miscommunications happened early on that nowadays aren't there. It's more ubiquitous. But still happens, but anyway, 
um, we call social technologies things like um, learning how to do a check-in, dyad, one-on-one. -on -one. The idea being, and this was actually true in the Pledge of Resistance in the Coordinating Council, we had a policy that if you clash in the meeting with somebody, if you clash, even if we worked out in the meeting, you were supposed to go check in with them after the meeting and say, are we clear? Is there any leftover feelings? Because we were doing such high level work, you know, really intense. We were really, and we were inviting people to break the law. And we were going up against the federal government. We knew we had to be solid. And we couldn't just, you know, have little bickerings get in the way of our solid work. So we had, and the policy was you were expected to check in. If you checked in or if you didn't check in, and you checked in and what didn't go well, then the next meeting, the group would check, and if it didn't, we would assign a mediator from within the group and say, you have to work it out. We can't have you, either one of you in this group if you can't work together. We were that highly disciplined. So, uh, so, so being able to do um, NBC, or nonviolent communication technique. As a technique, I support it. As a worldview, I do not. As a technique, it's really good. Learning that technique, learning a thing called Heart of Now, which came out of a larger technique called the Zeg Forum. The Zeg Forum came out of a textual community called Zeg in Germany that is very radical, very political, they do a lot of squats, and they developed this technique of sort of going deep with people on a personal, individual level, not just a political level. So what they learned in these political movements, and what we've learned, is that it's more important to bond, to create webs of connection that happen in face-to-face -face connections, in real experiences that are non-linear. Non-linear is an important aspect, so much so that there's a man, I don't know, has anybody here heard of sociocracy or dynamic governance? Anybody here? It's okay. okay. So, there's a version of group organization that's very cooperative, but it's still hierarchical, and it's friendly towards consensus decision making. It came out of Holland, and it's working, it's, and businesses are using it in Europe, and it's very good. I mean, it's more positive in the sense that it's more collaborative. And a lot of groups are, that try consensus and fail because they don't take it very seriously, in my opinion, they don't make it value based. They are moving to sociocracy. And the guy in North America who teaches it, his name is John Buck. And I'm a good friend of his. He and I work together now. And we talk regularly. And where was I going with this? Okay. Right. Heart of Now. Oh, the Heart of Now, right. Is that, um, that, um, people working in dyads, people right. working in space time. He and I got together because we both were, we're both excellent facilitators. We're both at the top of our game. Right? We're both national speakers teaching governance. And we got together and we were having a social salon. So he and I would get together for breakfast once a week when we live near each other. And um, we both realized that we, in all of our skill and all of our knowledge, regularly have groups of 20 or more get to stuck places as they're trying to make a decision. They get in these stuck places and there's nothing we can do about it. And we were frustrated by that because we realized it wasn't facilitation, it wasn't more facilitation, it wasn't better facilitation that was going to change that. And we also saw that it wasn't necessarily even the group doing anything wrong. It was sort of like what happens to individual people and groups when they get into this deep material, trying to make an important decision. So we backed off and started looking at a larger picture of what's going on. We started studying how the brain works. And we got way into where creativity comes from. But we'll go into all that. It's very fascinating. John thinks that we've stumbled upon something around creativity that's as exciting as the theory of relativity was for physics and Einstein. If it's true, it's going to knock these people's socks off. But we're still working it. We haven't perfected it yet. But as we're experimenting, the reason why I'm telling you this is, so we're working on this, we're studying the brain. The thing is, I've come up with this theory of how the brain works, and John, who's a scientist, and he's from corporate America, and he got into sociocracy because he saw that the way that voting in corporate America was dysfunctional. They wanted a better way to have meetings for businesses. He's, you know, an American, he's a little bit older than I am, but he's not trying to sell you to be a revolutionary. He just recognizes that things have to change. So um, we were looking at this, we were studying, and we decided to take a group of people and have a meeting, start a meeting, and when we just randomly, because we didn't we couldn't predict it'd be a stuck place, like we can't we can't program them. That's the point. If we could, then we could drill them. We can't. But we decided to just randomly invite them as they're trying to make a decision, completely outside the box, go to random word association. Okay, so we're having a meeting, and we just said, okay, every stop, they, they knew we were going to do something. They didn't know what. We had them do five minutes of a brain, uh, of, you know, brainstorm or a shout out, where people just said, this is just somebody shouts out a word, and then 
If you, if you resonate with that word, you can say whatever word resonates, you anything you want. And we have people do that, single words or phrases, for about maybe not even three minutes. And then as, as abruptly as we started it, we ended it, and then we started the meeting up again. And the next thing that happened, really quick after that, was that somebody had an emotive experience. They broke down, they, they, they blurred out something that hadn't come out yet. And it turned out, and then we went deeper with that, what's going on there, and something came out that these people have been, this, this is an intentional community, these people have been living together for a, more than a decade. And it turned out that this one guy was having a problem with this one woman because she reminded him of his mother. And he was reactive to her saying what she was saying, not because of what she was saying, but because he heard his mother's voice in her. Transference, right. But it was, he wasn't conscious of it, and it had been going on for years, and it came out spontaneously because what we've noticed with random word association, is, and what we were arguing, was that people start out with apple, uh, sky, cat, you know, weird stuff, and they just kind of go, but eventually people start saying words like sad, or emotive words, and where's that coming from? And, and, and you can notice that the, the word associations kind of flow, they kind of make sense in a certain kind of way, but they lead to emotions. When the emotions start coming up, people are activated. And then we shut off that part and go back into our work, and they don't get deactivated. They're still now in that space. So that stuff comes out, and we get to what's really going on. Now that's social technology. See what I'm saying? Yeah. That's learning how to work with each other. So what you're saying is like the digital, is like we should keep the digital just for like the basic organizing information, like helping with schedules, right. when people volunteer, like sort of like logistical, administration. Well, not just. Keep the important stuff for face-to-face -face and, and encourage more right. meetups. But, but I'm, I'm very holistic. So I would say just like the, 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 the fact that we all use mobility aids, I'm pretty certain in this circle, we all use mobility aids. Some of us have two legs and we use cars to go long distances. We're not going to walk. We could, and some of us don't have use of our legs and use wheelchairs just to do the average getting from here to the point from here to over there. But we all use mobility aids. Well, in the same way, if we cannot be in the same room together, then we use technology. We have, a, 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 you know, at very least, a, a conference call. Maybe we have Skype, which some people can see. Maybe we have an avatar and a 3D projector, and you're actually sitting there, right? All those are better. Better than not doing it at all. So I'm not, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying that I don't know of any technological, electronic alternative to being face-to-face. -face. Because there's things that are communicating face-to-face that are even like all olfactory and you know the cosmic energy of the, all of us sitting here together interacting this web of eye contact that, that's why we sit in circles by the way the main reason why we sit, sit in circles is because as human beings with sight and the amount of we use sight we're communicating with each other non-verbally in the circle hey michael constantly sending signals to each other about what's going on in the circle and who's who's to be listened to who's not to be listened to especially in a meeting so all that's lost if you're on a computer and the computer doesn't show you what's going on in the room. Whereas we can just turn our head and see everybody's eye. And we, and we deal with inclusion a lot within these different movements within activism, but then we don't talk about actually including people that have different modes of perception. Yeah. The verbal language very well. And they will prefer to communicate via some sort of kinesthetic or body or nonverbal or even even like you said, olfactory, it could be anything that people use. Or they'll try to communicate in a way that is not comfortable to the other people, but it's the way they communicate. That's that, and that can be managed though. That's not automatic. And there are ways that can be uh, facilitated so that it works for the whole group. But that requires strong facilitation and a recognition that process is not the same thing as content. And what the facilitator is doing is not trying to control you, but trying to help you. Because if you communicate in a way that threatens other people in the room, they're gonna stop listening. Yes. They're not gonna hear what you have to say. And it's not your fault, that's just the way it is. So to help, if a facilitator recognizes that and facilitates so they can actually help you express what you really want to say, isn't that better for everybody? So you gotta let them, if they know what they're doing, you gotta let them do it. And this idea, no, I can't stop after two minutes because I can talk as long as I want. No, that doesn't work when there's, you know, we have 20 minutes to have a, speak, a talk about something and there's 10 of us sitting here, we each get two minutes. That's the way it works. Otherwise, all voices aren't being heard. So anyway, other questions or anything else? Yeah, um, I'd like to talk to you more about that, that particular point later, actually. Later, but, yeah. but um, 
in terms of affinity groups, right? Yeah. Um, if you're living in an intentional community, or you're living in the same household, it would seem like you already have a really big leg up to having an affinity group. Yeah. Um, if you don't, if you live, say, in an apartment in Brooklyn, and so do the rest of the people you know, and you know, you're all working in separate jobs, and you don't see one another on any kind of basis, and then you want to do an activity together, how the hell do you form an affinity group? I mean, that really is actually vital yeah. without having that kind of intentional community. Well, first, I would say start the intentional community. That's, that's where I'm at now. That's actually the way to do it. Because, because what Ren and I are talking about doing is forming a, a base, uh, an institute, a residential community, and bringing people in who we can detox so they can learn what we're teaching. Because what we're realizing is we've all been poisoned. We've all been polluted. All of us, including Ren and I. I mean, when we're in the overculture, we're not functioning at our best in this is what we want. And so if we're really going to teach this, we have to bring people in and actually have them go through a week of detox before they can actually be absorbed what we're teaching them. It's that toxic, we believe. Okay, we've gotten that, that's where we're at. But recognizing again that that's not going to happen for everybody, um, this is the vision I hold. Again, affinity groups are, are amoebas. We used to play this game when I, was, uh, when I was a raging hippie. 